Many people have asked for the Chevy SS, or is it a Holden? Well, we're at Autobahn Country Club, and Jack's already being an asshole. Let's get started. The Chevrolet SS, also known as the Holden Commodore, BF generation. Now this car is not American, in fact has very little to do with GM North America. This entire vehicle was manufactured, engineered, and designed in Australia. What they left us with, however, is a V8 rear-wheel drive sports sedan. A car that means something entirely different here than it does in Australia. There, the Commodore has the unenviable task of having to be all things to all people. It's in fact a monumental responsibility. They had to make a family sedan variant, a station wagon, a sports sedan like this, and even a pickup truck. And because of that, the story behind this vehicle and the engineering behind it is almost more interesting than the car itself. Now before we talk about all of that in the shop, let's talk about the interior. From the practical perspective, the SS excels. After all, this is a four-door sedan with an enormous trunk. There's a lot of cargo capacity in this thing, specifically in the door cart, center console, and glove box. There's enough space for four to five full-size adults in this thing, and you can go on a long journey in relative comfort. Really, my only knock against this cabin from a utility perspective is the fact that the rear seats don't fold down. All you have is a ski pass-through, which I don't know about you, but I can't conduct my business transactions in Aspen. I can't conduct business deals in this space. What is this? Fundamentally, from an ergonomic perspective, this cabin's great, starting with the seats. They're eight-way adjustable, heated and cooled, leather and Alcantara. They look a little sportier than they actually are, which means if you're a larger person, you should fit in this thing fine. You have great headroom, and the seats are long, which means your legs don't fall asleep on long journeys. Pedal box. Easy to heel toe. Pedals are exactly where they need to be. Steering wheel, flat bottom, right location, and not overly thick. And the shifter, and this is kind of my only point of contention with this car, Gates are easy to find, it's very positive, but much like a BMW, it feels a little plasticky. When it comes to the infotainment and HVAC controls, they're all physical. So with that, let's talk about the interior electronics. Keeping in perspective that this car came out in 2014, it's hard to fault the interior electronics too much. Yes, the Bose audio system in typical GM fashion is horrible, but the cabin is quiet, and you can remedy that with an aftermarket set. Chevy MyLink, they never added Apple CarPlay or Android Auto throughout the years, but it's still easy to use. USB audio and Bluetooth audio works great, easy to pair. Really the only faults I have with this cabin are the fact that a lot of this, no fault of Holden, is a GM parts bin special, meaning the switch gear, all of that other nonsense comes straight out of things like a Chevy Trax or Chevy Equinox, which means it doesn't fit the characteristic of a $50,000 car. They did try to remedy that with some of their design language. The dash looks great, and there's a good use of leather and Alcantara throughout this cabin. And the Alcantara is put in places you don't touch, so it ages well. So with all of that said, let's head to the shop and talk about the history of the Holden, or Chevy SS. We are underneath the Chevrolet SS, Jack, and this is one of those cars that has a lot of baggage. <laughs> From a social commentary perspective to a car enthusiast perspective and economically for Australia. So Holden as a brand may not be well known in the United States and we could probably do a documentary about it, but they've been around since the 1800s. They turned into a car company in the early 1900s and then around 19, in the 1930s, they GM, merged with GM. They merged with GM of Australia and became kind of really GM with the Holden name. And, you know, they had a period of great success and then do, 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 do. So in the 80s and 90s, they had financial difficulty. And then when 2000 came around, when all the manufacturers in Australia were having issues, they started to become subsidized by taxpayer money or government money. 
and it's been kind of a downhill slide ever since. And recently, well, 2017, she pulled the plug and the entire brand will disappear from Australia in 2021. Finally, unfortunately, going away, which many of our viewers are Australian, about yes. 30%, which blows my mind. Yeah, and it's kind of, it goes up and down, but it's been as high as 30%, uh, and that's just crazy to me. But and to those people, this brand means a lot. It does, and you had a lot of people that lost their jobs, and granted, by the end, there wasn't as many people for work, working for Holden, but we've experienced this in GM culture in the United States. It's not just Australians. We've had factories closed in Canada, the United States, where they're moving away from cars and just killing off plants. I mean, there's documentaries made about GM. And, you know, when I saw this car, and I know it's not really truly at the heart of it a GM, it still just turns me off. I'm sorry. It just. Well, it, GM is modern day OCP for yeah. better and for worse. They are quintessential big business. Big business. Yeah, biggest business possible. So I've worked for companies that are like this that you know they have a very narrow view it's just cutting losses the bottom line not people correct. correct so holden as a brand was not able to survive this partially because they had the stranglehold of being owned by gm but also gm's credit holden really didn't make themselves that marketable outside of australia they only made cars yep. cars are going away and australia only has about a million car sales a year new car sales and that's competing against companies like toyota Honda, yeah. BMW, all the other brands. So if you're only moving 30, 40,000 cars a year, GM is going to look at that and be like, our money is better spent elsewhere. Yeah, why why, ha why hold on to this brand? We'll kill it off like Pontiac. Pontiac's a big American name they killed off with the G8. So it's not just a GM thing. Uh, other brands have are suffering right now. You see Volvo that took huge money from Geely. You see companies like... Aston Martin. Aston Martin being partially owned by Mercedes or Lotus being bought out by Geely. These companies need to diversify out, get outside their home market to be successful and hold in, well, mostly because of GM. They did not have the money and they just couldn't do it and now they're gone. Unfortunately. So, but what we have left is a piece of history here. So this is our Chevy SS, but in reality, this is the Holden Commodore VF generation, which replaced the VE generation, which we got as the G8. So what they did is they took that Zeta architecture and modernized it a little bit for 2013 when this car first came out. So they used aluminum in the body, specifically in the hood, fenders, and trunk. And then the core of the chassis itself, they added more high strength steel to and cut weight. So the basic VF Commodore at its core is 75 kilos lighter than the VE generation. And in the front, you have things like a more BMW looking strut setup. You have an aluminum knuckle, which is tiny. And the uh, lower half of the suspension is also aluminum, the lower control arm specifically. But everything else looks like an older car. And because it is. And the fact, actually, the reason why this looks like a BMW is the Zeta platform, specifically the Holdens, the VE and the VF, were benchmarked against the E39 M5. But the development team did not come from BMW. No, it did not. So in the front here, you'll notice strut front suspension with Magna Ride dampers, which were added to our Chevy SS in 2014. They went away from a hydraulic unit. And what's unique about this electric rack is it's... Well, first off, the assist is rack mounted, which adds for greater feel with reducing NVH. And I will say, because this car has Magna Ride and a lot of other stuff, and it's electric, the steering modes change based upon what suspension mode you're in. So it's not necessarily the most natural feeling steering, but it does have good feel. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at the back of the car. All right. So is it story time, Mark? Yep, you better grab your blankie because we typically don't talk stuff like this in the shop. At home, though. I have my teddy, though. <laughs> okay, good. So here it is. My first press car was a Buick LaCrosse. My first connection was with a GM rep. And like it or not, he was the reason why we're standing here right now. And he's no longer with GM, mind you. But he was with them for over 20 years. So in terms of the corporate businessman, he was everything GM was. He towed the line. He did. So he was also brutally honest and kind of like, oh, a way that I didn't like. He's but, John Business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was truth to it. So the first time I met up with him was at the Chicago Auto Show. 
on a, one of the press days and he brought me around the booth. He's like, oh, let me show you around. And by the bathrooms at the ass end of the GM display was this and a Corvette. And I'm like, these cars are really cool in person. He's like, yeah, but let me, we don't care about these. Let me show you what we care about. And he took me to the front of the display where there was some new trim level Silverado with you know, bigger wheels all packaged in for like a cheap price. He's like, this is what pays the bills, not that. And that sums up everything you need to know about the mentality of cars like this or enthusiast cars for most companies. Niche enthusiast cars that don't cost an ass load of money like a GT3 do not help, o do not help big OEMs. And that's the problem with this car. GM fulfilled their manufacturing obligation to Holden and did nothing else. Yeah. They squandered an opportunity, but it's also on us as the consumer. Right. We say we will buy something and never, ever do. Let's talk about the transmission, Jack. So you had two options with this car, a 6L80E, which is GM's tried and true six-speed automatic. It's very old, and to be honest, I wouldn't buy it. What you want is the TR6060 manual. It doesn't have rev match, but it's solid, it's reliable, it's very, very stout, and there are a ton of parts for it. The back, what do we have for a differential? So you have a clutch pack style rear diff. It's pretty good actually. This car has more of a behavior putting down power versus a Hellcat that just goes lock all the time. Mm -hmm. But you know, it fits its character. I will say the rear end of this car, specifically the subframe and the rear suspension. Yes, this doesn't have the chassis rigidity of you know, ultra modern cars. Like a, and I like a modern M3. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason why this feels kind of more comfortable and relaxed to drive. It's very predictable. And, you know, I didn't really, I didn't do the drive, which you'll see, but in my attempts to kind of corner and turn under hard acceleration, the way that one, the engine is tuned, it, it doesn't feel like it just wants to shred the rear tires off this car. It's very, very predictable. It's more of traction versus going sideways like some of the other, you know, higher horsepower cars of today. So this is a confidence inspiring car and a lot of this is just suspension setup. Yeah, and in the rear end, unlike the front, your lower control arms are not aluminum, but your uppers are, and the knuckle is steel versus aluminum in the front. The last thing to bring up back here. What about them? They're active and Ooh. they burble. Now they do make a lot of noise. I didn't think it was a stock exhaust at first, but it's got, a really good warm tonal quality without droning. That's something you want in a sedan like this. And obviously, if you want it louder, you know exactly what to do. I'll get the hacksaw down here. <laughs> Let's talk about the engine, Jack. It's an LS3. Again, much like the Trans, tried and true. It's been around for a really, really long time. It's port only, not direct. And thankfully, the manual does not have active fuel management. So it should be pretty reliable. Unlike the G8. So you don't have to go through the extra effort of trying to delete the fuel management system or the cylinder deactivation system. But like the owner did, that's one of the few mods he did was delete the skip shift. Yeah, GM's version of fuel economy is in a sports car to force you to go from first to fourth. It's so annoying. But anyway, easily deleted. I think it's time to take this on the road, Jack. All right. This car has traveled a long way to be getting in the hands of a monkey like you. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. The owner brought this thing all the way from Michigan. You're kidding. No, but you want to know why? Why? LS3 V8 rear wheel drive. Oh man, not again. <laughs> you know, it's safe to say, Mark, oh. <laughs> that I uh, rather enjoy this particular automobile. It's because it has the holy trinity, Mark. Yeah, what's that? Manual, rear wheel drive, and a V8. Oh, I thought that I thought the holy trinity was a wagon and a nice four cylinder <laughs> with a CVT, couple battery packs. You know, I thought, you know, EVs make something like this irrelevant. Well, Mark, you may be right, but this has eight cylinders and a actually pretty good soundtrack. I'm normally not the biggest fan of the LS power plant. I don't feel like it has a lot of character, 
but damn is it effective in this car. And with the rather throaty exhaust and sound tube like we talked about in the shop, it does motivate this car in a rather entertaining fashion. You know what this reminds me of, Mark? What? Well, we talked about it. They benched it against an E39 M5, but this drives the way the Clive Owen films made the E39 look like it drove. So I didn't know anything about this car. I mean, I knew enough about it, but when I drove it for the first time, I had to close my eyes and the fact that we're in a GM or a Chevy to realize and appreciate how great the body control, the ride control, and the ride quality is in here and how connected the car feels without being a sideways fest. Kind of like the Hellcats, those cars want to walk all over the place. This doesn't. No, it's, it's really, really stable. It's well composed. It's not what I was expecting. I was expecting a slower Hellcat. And what I got was a driver's car, surprisingly. I don't know if I'd go that far. It feels more, it, it does have that barge feeling to me in the steering, and it doesn't help that I have to keep looking at the steering wheel on this thing and being reminded, <laughs> oh God, I can't even take it. I was blinded by the plastic chrome in here like three <laughs> times on the way. I, I just, oh The worst God. part about this car is that Holden's parent company was General Motors, which means there's a lot of interior part sharing and the fact that this car, when new, was $50,000 in 2017. It's a hard pill to swallow. It really is. I mean, I'm glad this thing exists. The fact that they put a lot of work into this car in Australia to make it drive the way it does is very impressive. It, for like a 3,900 pound car is nimble. It has reasonable body control. It's not a track car, but because it rides correctly, you can use it as a daily and that's what this owner does. And so, you can carry four or five people. Yeah. and just getting away from making the jokes about the interior it's really not that bad i thought when you know you're like oh you're gonna hate the interior and i'm like i was expecting kind of like a cobalt ss like that that level of shittiness and then it's really really not that bad yes you have the overuse of all the gimmicky materials and just some of the, the walmart looking design of <laughs> the steering wheel and the gauge cluster but the core of why you're buying this is what you said for Four passenger car, it's big, you can haul stuff, you can use it every day, and the Magna Ride suspension in here, which I have on my Ferraris, uh, does a great job in normal mode. There, you would never, never guess that it was Magna Ride. It run, it, it's so... Uh. <laughs> you were saying? And the fact that <laughs> it does a great job between switching its modes. If you need to firm it up for higher speed stuff, if you're on the highway a lot and you don't want the floaty feeling, you have the ability to do it and it doesn't beat you up. This is a great car. It's greatly tuned in terms of suspension. Trans feels solid. The engine has a good note without being droney or annoying. It, it's just sad that it takes these cars being killed off to really appreciate it. But it came out in a time at a price point for all the cost cutting that they did and the lack of marketing made this kind of like... Dead on arrival was DOA. It, it was DOA. And it, you can blame GM for that, at least in the United States. And the last thing to say is this, if, if you like a sleeper car, there is absolutely nothing like this in the past like five years. You will have so much excess blood flow to your genitals getting behind the wheel of this. Nobody knows what it is. And just, it, that's what's so cool about it. Yeah, and dynamically, it feels old. We talked about it in the, in the it shop does. segment. It feels like an older car. It was based on an older car. The roots are old, but... But that's partly what gives it its character. It's got a lot of charm. There, not everything has to be ultra rigid, ultra light, you know, just so polished. This is not a polished car. It's just a really balanced, comfortable rear wheel drive cruiser with a manual transmission. That's all you can really ask for, I think, in a car like this. If you're prepared to pay the money, and it is a lot of money, yeah, and the used yeah, market is. is a joke. It's... But that's because of this. Yeah. You know, what are you doing with your hand, by the way? Well, what do you think I'm doing, Mark? 
You should put that hand to some better use. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's get to the final thoughts. We'll talk about all the rest of the pros and the cons. All right. Final thoughts on the Chevy SS. And first, a huge thank you to the owner of this vehicle, Ross, who's also a viewer. He drove it all the way from Michigan and dropped it off in Illinois so we can make a video on it. So thank him in the comments. Also, thanks to Alex, who's provided some of the technical information on this car all the way from Australia. Now, let's get on to the pros and cons. I have a complete mixed feeling about this. A lot of it has to do with the fact that this car has been killed off that the brand has been killed off after a hundred years of being in business. The fact that people have lost their jobs, the people that are passionate about this uh, have to move on and that's life. But in terms of this car, I, the big takeaway for me is it doesn't feel like GM gave it its full treatment that they could have. It feels like there was cost cutting done when you get on the interior, like, come on. It just wasn't fully actualized. They gave up on it. And I truly believe aside from the business reason for it that this was in direct competition of something gm had already put a exponential amounts of money in and that is cadillac cadillac struggled it's a rear wheel drive v8 most of them are v8s and this why bother and now that holden is gone this is one of the things to remember it by so what are the pros here they are the weight distribution this has been tried true tested for so many years you got a cross balance of almost 50%. You got a front and rear distribution of 50%. You have a rear wheel drive architecture with a manual transmission, which is completely dying. It's in a sedan form factor that one is super neutral to drive. It rides amazing. You have enough room to put people in and put things in the trunk without having to have an SUV. This is a dying piece of equipment and it's going to hold its value for those reasons. But the things that I can't stand about it Aside from, well, this doesn't have a Chevy badge on it. The interior, God, no. I mean, it's not horrible, but it just reminds me of some of the shit boxes that Chevy makes. It's like an Equinox from basically the steering wheel forward. The seats are pretty good. The plastics are okay, but it's just cost cutting at its worst. And they let it die a painful death. And I think that's how we're gonna have to remember it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.